Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Sato. I'm the Associate Dean for the Division of Teaching Excellence and Innovation. I'm also a faculty member in the Biological Sciences, and I'm going to be presenting here today along with Andrea Abersold, who is our Director of Faculty Instructional Development. We're going to tell you about some stuff that we're doing on our campus in regards to active learning. Uh, so today, we're going to tell you a little bit about what active learning is, what we're doing here on campus, some data we've collected to highlight uh, whether or not the things that we're trying to implement are working. And then we have an illustrious faculty panel who will come up and share their experiences uh, about what we've been doing so far. So just a quick plug for our division, the Division of Teaching Excellence and Innovation. This is a campus-wide division, meaning that we don't serve specific disciplines. Everyone on, on campus is, is more than welcome to come chat with us. Uh, we have our faculty instructional development group led by Andrea. We have our graduate student postdoctoral instructional development, Danny, who was here, but apparently he went to the other session. <laughs> uh, Matt Williams, right there, our principal analyst for learning environments. We've got a learning experience design and online education group led by Megan Linos. And then we have a teaching and learning research center. So one of the goals of DTI over the past few years has really been to increase the prevalence of active learning on our campus. And so before we talk about uh, those efforts, the first question is, well, what is active learning? Imagine it's a select group of folks in here, so many of you probably already know the answer to this. Um, but everyone in here, regardless, has heard the term active learning, I'm sure. There's a lot of different definitions of active learning. There's a lot of different examples of ways that you can implement active learning in the classroom. Um, but sort of a broad definition is any form of instruction where students are more engaged in the learning process or student-centered instruction. So the idea that it's not just a lecturer standing here telling you stuff and the students dutifully copying things down, it's the students participating and, and generating uh, a lot of that information on their own. So the question is, well, why, why bother changing that? We've been teaching one way for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, this is very familiar to... I guess this laser pointer doesn't do anything. Uh, this is very familiar to, to really any college campus across the country. You will see a picture of something like that. There's the guy at the bottom who's sleeping, and the ones at the top are, are talking to each other, and that guy next to them is probably texting. So <laughs> why change? We've been doing this for so long. Why bother changing? And so our speaker this morning uh, brought this up nicely, the fact that there's a lot of data now that shows that active learning leads to better student outcomes. Uh, so one of these things from the meta-analysis that she mentioned, this decrease in failure rates. So classes that are taught with active learning have lower failure rates than, than those with traditional lecture. There's increasing evidence that this is uh, disproportionately beneficial for students who are traditionally underrepresented in higher education. And this is really important here at UCI. We're 50% first generation. We have about 40% of our students uh, who are low income. About a third are underrepresented minorities. So it's not enough that we say, welcome to UCI, go figure it out. We want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to succeed uh, on our campus. And so that sounds all well and good. Let's all just go do active learning. Uh, but there are tons of barriers to implementing active learning. Uh, the classroom layouts. So if you've seen a, a typical college uh, uh, lecture hall, it's very the theater seats where you're trying to pack everyone in. It's really hard to talk to the people around you, hard to move around, hard for the instructor to get access to the students who are sitting and trying to hide in the middle of the lecture hall. Um, Lack of professional development opportunities. Uh, so as was mentioned this morning as well, that we teach the way that we were taught. And so we were all taught with traditional lecture. That's what we know. And so to switch over to active learning is not a simple thing to do. Faculty in, uh, time and incentive, particularly at research institutions, which value research, tend to value research more heavily, although we've been doing a lot of work on our campus to make sure that teaching uh, excellence is awarded as well. And then student buy-in. So I remember when I was a student, I wanted to go to class, didn't want to talk to anybody, wanted to listen to the instructor and then leave. And so the idea that we now tell these students, hey, talk to your neighbor, there's a lot of barriers to that, that getting them comfortable and accepting that that's the way that maybe we're going to be doing uh, our teaching on campus. So there are a few different ways that we've been working to, to increase the prevalence of active learning on campus. The campus made a huge commitment to creating this new building, the Anteater Learning Pavilion. Uh, which we'll tell you a little bit about. Um, Andrea's flagship program, the Active Learning Institute, which she will tell you about to really make sure that we, we prepare our instructors for these activities. 
So our Anteater Learning Pavilion, if you haven't been there yet, I highly encourage you to go take a look at it. Uh, opened in fall of 2018. It is uh, unique in that all of the classroom spaces are built for active learning. So we have these large lecture halls. They look very uh, similar to, to really any lecture halls, but there's a few unique characteristics. So one is the seat swivel 360 degrees, so you can uh, talk to uh, everyone around you, form groups with everyone around you. We have these uh, rows that are pretty spread out, so the instructor can go and actually talk to every single person in the building. We have these smaller uh, classrooms, 50, 50 to 100 or so seats in the middle. Those are set up in pods, which enables you to come in and the groups are already formed. And then we have these smaller rooms as well with the sort of bumper car chairs where you can go and make your own groups if necessary. We also have a lot of informal learning spaces in the anterior learning pavilion. Uh, most of our classrooms are just classrooms and that's it. So once you're done with class, you go off and disperse wherever. Um, but we have students, they'll be there at eight in the morning studying, they'll be there at 10 at night studying. So it's really become a place where a lot of collaborative learning can happen. Come on up, Andrea. So Andrea's gonna tell us about her program, the Active Learning Institute. Okay, I'll pull this up. So, the Active Learning Institute. Um, when I came to UCI a few years ago, this was the first thing that I was charged with designing. And there's been a few other programs at universities that have done kind of the same thing, wanted to prep faculty because they got new classrooms and things like that. But they did things that were like a two hour workshop or a day and a half summit on getting ready to teach in these classrooms. And I thought, well, how about we just make eight 90-minute workshops instead? And, but I'm so glad that the keynote this morning talked about the need for this long-term, more intensive faculty development because, whew, that's what I decided to do. But also, research came out later. Um, there was a paper that did uh, some follow-up with faculty after they went to a workshop. And we've all been there. You go to a workshop, you go to a conference, you're super jazzed about the ideas you heard. I'm going to go back and make all these changes. And then a year later, these, the, these researchers followed up, and the faculty were like, oh, yeah, I didn't do any of that. Like, the, the enthusiasm wears off. And so having something that's a little more intensive, long term, so eight 90 minute workshops over eight or sometimes 16 weeks, um, that covers building a course from beginning to end. So not just here's some ideas about activities you can be doing, but what do you need to be thinking about in terms of equity and inclusion, your course goals, making sure things align, getting that student buy in, which is so important. So, um, I'm going to show just a preview of kind of what those workshops look like. So they're, they're capped at 32 because I also really wanted, um, can I click on this or not, Brian? Never. I have. This is supposed to be a link. It doesn't work. Oh. Oh, whoops. That's okay. <laughs> You'll have to imagine. Um, so the, the 90 minute workshops start with sort of what are your ideas of active learning, trying to get some um, discrepancies with active learning um, addressed. So faculty you think, oh, it's all about technology. To do active learning, you have to do technology. And the great thing about the building is that technology is the option, thank you, um, but it's not required. So here, these are I set up a website for each of the um, cohorts. And so here you can see um, these are the sessions and what we talk about. So a lot of community building on the first one. I have them watch videos of UCI faculty teaching with active learning so that they can get a sense of, oh, that's how someone does it, how, how they do it in a large class. There's a real anxiety about that. And then starting to think about your goals, how do you put things together? All right, what are some activities and assignments you can start doing? Group work, everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> Students hate it, faculty don't love it, but it's a good thing to do. So what are some research and best practices behind making it less of a painful experience? Uh, inclusivity, um, getting some feedback from colleagues. Then we talk about technology and space, so I purposely put that more towards the end so that wasn't like the forefront of it. Um, and then talking about, okay, you've got all these great ideas. Now let's do the student buy-in part of it. So that's the series that they go through. Um, I post links and all these things on here, research and things for faculty to read more about. That's how the institute um, has been running, and we've been we've been very successful with it. Um, I'll go back to. <clears throat> Oh, 
Okay. So we're going to talk about numbers in a little bit, but um, so 32 participants per institute to create a sense of community, faculty getting to know each other and create some support. And then the nice carrot that we had in the beginning um, that we continue to have is that certified faculty, so doing this um, allows you to get priority scheduling in the new building, in the ALP. And so these are sort of the things that um, came together. The final step, so I also added faculty accountability, which is not something that a lot of places had done, which is you do the institute, but then you have to do this class observation using our tool, um, COPUS, which we'll talk more about in a bit, to show that you can run a class with no more than 50% lecture. And so you're taking these ideas through this long-term program, but now you're also going to implement them and kind of show us that you're able to do that. So that was something else that was kind of new that I, that I input there. Um, other things on campus, um, oh, here's our participants first I'll talk about. So we started in fall 2017 with a pilot group that was a year before the building opened. And here's the percentage of, of ranks of faculty that have gone through it. We've had 187 go through um, and the, the areas that they're from, so STEM, social science, et cetera. So what made me really happy is to see the balance amongst ranks. Um, everybody. Is, is taking part of it. It's not being dominated by just uh, one group of faculty. And I thought I would run maybe one a year, maybe hopefully get 20 faculty who were willing to put up with me for that long. And last year I had to do four, and we're just doing more and more every year because the demand's really high, which is great. It's been so much fun. It's been really the highlight of my experience here at UCI. And to continue hearing about how much faculty are getting out of it has just been so rewarding. A few other things that I do on campus related that are a little less intensive. We have these faculty pedagogical reading groups, just really low key getting together, reading some short chapters or articles about teaching and discussing and sharing our own ideas. We do have some faculty learning communities which are running, which are focused on different um, teaching ideas and issues within the schools. We, we try to run DTI workshops every year and then we also had so much interest from people doing the Active Learning Institute to keep going that we created the Active Learning Institute alumni group. And so we continue to still get together, discuss active learning, and have lunch. So those are some of the efforts that I run on campus. Right. I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. Um, so the next thing we want to quickly talk about is some of the data we've collected to see has any of this worked. Uh, if you talk to any, or if you go to any college campus, they will swear they're doing the greatest things in the world. And they'll say, well, this research over here said it was really great, and we're doing something that kind of looks like that, so we must be really great too. And so we really wanted to make sure that our, we wanted to know, are the programs that we are doing, we're implementing on campus, are they working, are they having an impact? And so there's a whole slew of research questions that we're looking to answer. First, in terms of classroom practices, are people actually using active learning in the classroom? And if so, what factors are correlating with its implementation? Uh, from the student perspective, how is the student experience shaped by active learning, uh, both in terms of the building as well as the practices, and how are academic outcomes, grades, and things like that being affected? From the instructor perspective, uh, what do the instructors think? Do they like the building? Do they like uh, using active learning? How does it impact how they change their teaching practices? And so in order to answer these, we're collecting a whole slew of data. So classroom observation data, COPUS data, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, from the student perspective, we're looking at a lot of course grades, demographics, we're interviewing and conducting surveys. And faculty, similarly, we're getting a lot of demographic data from them, as well as instructor surveys and interviews. So we don't have time to tell you much of this today, um, but we're going to focus on, on a couple of the different pieces. So the first is uh, this, this idea of classroom observation data. So we have students that are trained in what's known as the, the COPUS protocol, so Classroom Observation Protocol for Undergraduate STEM. It uh, was originally created for STEM courses. Um, we found it's pretty generalizable for most classes, although not all. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll have those students go into these classes and, and use this COPUS protocol. So what the protocol does is it asks the students or asks the observers who are observing this class to, dig, to note what are the instructors doing at a given time. And so different examples, things like, are they lecturing? Are they posing questions? Are they walking around the class? There are about 12 different codes that can uh, indicate what the instructor is doing at a given time. And similarly, what are the students doing? Are they listening to the instructor, working groups, asking questions, things like that? And the way the COPUS works is every two minutes, 
this observer jots that down. So every two minutes, what is the instructor doing? What, is, what are the students doing uh, throughout the entire class? So it gives you this really nice picture of not just did this happen, yes or no, but how often did it happen? When did it happen? So it gives you a lot of really rich data to work with. In 2018-19, we observed over 250 classes. Each of these classes got two different observations. Um, as far as what these classes were, about 50% we, we designated as large enrollment, more than 100 students. Uh, about 50% of them taught by female faculty. About 20% were certified through Andrea's active learning program. Um, a, a wide range of uh, different types of faculty teaching these courses, and about 50% of the classes were STEM. And so we've got these 250 courses that we have data from. We have an idea about what's happening inside these classes. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to characterize them. So are there different kinds of teaching that we're seeing? And so to accomplish that, what we did was cluster analysis. So this was done by Cameron DeNaro, who's in our Teaching and Learning Research Center. And what Cameron found is that when you look at these 250 classes, they fall into two separate bins. And so we're going to show you what these bins look like. So these are called radar plots. And basically what they're doing is they're saying for all of the courses within this specific cluster, on average, here is the amount of time spent doing one of these various things. So for example, instructor guiding in cluster one, about 30% of the class time is spent uh, with instructor guiding. Oh, sorry, one more thing. So there's two different lines on each, each of these radar plots. A green line, that's telling you the average for the, the courses in that particular cluster. The red is the average for the entire 250 course data set. So cluster one, if we look at the green line under instructor guiding, about 30% of the class period spent instructor guiding. And cluster two, that's about 70% of the time spent with this instructor guiding code. So I want you all to do a little bit of active learning. <laughs> Talk to your neighbors. Looking at cluster one and two, how would you characterize them? So I'll give you a minute or so to, to do that. And just with like my students, discuss verbally. Okay, so I'm going to stop you all there. So I don't expect you all to be able to figure out what the heck is going on here. And that's one of the things I really stress to my students. When I give them a problem to work with, there's this trepidation that if I don't know the answer, maybe I just shouldn't say anything at all. So the whole point of the active learning is just to get those ideas out there, get some, whatever you're thinking. We don't care if you're right or wrong. And the whole idea is just sort of what are we thinking. And being able to verbalize that makes it a lot more uh, sort of uh, real than if you just have random thoughts floating in your head. So are there any thoughts? What, what, what do we see here? What are some important features in, in these data? Now, did you get the answers from Cameron? Because then you don't get to. OK, go ahead, Rachel. No, just cluster two. Cluster two. Okay, so Rachel's pointing out, so if we look at cluster two, uh, there's a lot more instructor guiding, there's a lot less instructor presenting, there's a lot more student working, um, and so she classified this as more active, whereas if we look at cluster one, it's pretty much the entire time the instructor is presenting and the students are receiving. And so this sort of nicely falls into cluster one, we would call more traditional lecture, uh, cluster two we would call more active learning, 
And it turns out, in, of our 250 classes, a little more than 50% of our classes are actually falling within cluster two. So it seems like there is a decent amount of active learning happening on our campus. We're then curious to see, okay, if you've got these classes and they're being sorted into cluster one or cluster two, what are the factors that, that predict whether or not a given course is gonna fall in cluster one or cluster two? Um, things that positively correlated with a, a class falling in the active cluster, uh, whether or not the faculty member was certified uh, through the active learning program. So Andrea gets to keep her job because she's doing working really well. Uh, tenure track teaching faculty are more likely to have active learning uh, clustered classes and female faculty are more likely to have uh, active uh, learning courses. As far as negatively correlated, it's course enrollment. So the larger, the larger enrollment courses are more likely gonna fall in the traditional lecture. Um, if we break it down by room type, so if we look at the first two bars, that's looking at the larger lecture halls, we see that there's less active learning happening in the larger classrooms compared to the smaller ones at the bottom. Um, but we also notice in either case, if you've got a, a lecture hall that's in the anteater learning pavilion that's built for active learning, you're more likely to have act that class fall in the active learning bin. Uh, similarly with the smaller classes, those found in the anteater learning pavilion are also more likely uh, to be clustered uh, as active learning. So a lot of uh, things that are reinforcing what we expected to see, but now that we have data to, to support it, it makes it much more powerful. Um, not gonna touch on this too much, uh, but I did mention we looked at students and instructors as well and got their perspective on what was going on. Um, one of the things we measured from students, uh, we surveyed them to, to see the degree of social context. And what social context is, is it examines the strength of interpersonal relationships in the classroom, so peer-to-peer -peer interactions, peer-to-instructor interactions, uh, the, the stronger the bond, the more positive uh, those interactions are. We found that social context is positively correlated, again, with all the things that we would imagine. So if you have a faculty member who's active learning certified, students in that class are more likely to feel more social context. If you had a, a classroom that actually implemented active learning, again, the students are more likely to feel social context. And then also classrooms that were in the anteater learning pavilion again, is, are helping to build these relationships among students. Negatively correlated, again, large course enrollment, and also STEM disciplines. So that's something that's uh, sort of nationally known, the, the chilly environment in STEM classes. And we're trying to do a lot on campus to improve that. And I think we are, are getting there as well. Um, a couple, we, we surveyed instructors as well. And like I mentioned, we'll hear uh, directly from the faculty in a minute, but uh, one of the things may, we asked them to rate their agreement. This classroom enables me to incorporate more peer learning activities uh, from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Things are pretty negative in our traditional lecture halls, uh, much more positive in the, the learning pavilion rooms. And we also asked them, uh, I will actively seek out this type of classroom the next time I teach this course. Uh, again, not very happy with the traditional rooms, much more positive with the anteater learning pavilion rooms. So we have a ton more data that, that I don't have time to show you and a ton more data that uh, we haven't had time to analyze. Um, but things are looking positive. Things are, things are uh, looking like we, we would imagine for the most part. But we really want to hear about what's going on from, from the perspective of actual faculty who have gone through the certification process as well as been trained in the building. So I will let Andrea uh, lead this part of the, the panel. Our, our panel while they're we're, they're coming up um, what I'm going to do is I have a few opening questions to get our conversation started but uh, we'd like to take questions from you if you have them so there's there's two mics that are, are set up on either side of the room here if you'd like to ask a question go ahead and and line up there and uh, that'll signal to me that I can uh, call on you to ask a question so I'm happy to report I got to work with all these lovely individuals through the Active Learning Institute. So I'm gonna have them introduce themselves real quick and then I'll kick it off with our opening question. You're looking at me, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm Ted Wright. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a faculty member in cognitive science. I've been here 26 years. Um, I had been teaching courses that use a lot of active learning that were smaller for a long time um, and then about 12 years ago, I started teaching uh, the, one of our uh, large Lecture G courses. It's one of this three-quarter sequence that teaches psych psychology fundamentals. And 
um, that, that was an interesting experience for me because I just I didn't I didn't have the vaguest idea how to how to do anything like this. I was in the first ALI Institute, and it was an eye opener. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Mitchell. I am in the history department. I've been on campus 17 years. Um, I really appreciate one of Brian's slides, right, the um, medieval illumination about teaching. Um, I have a similar but different <coughs> photograph that I use in presentations when I say, historians, flipping classrooms since 1140, um, <laughs> which is a real date related to the, um, the founding of the Sorbonne. But like Ted, I found that much easier to do in small classrooms than in big, and it was taking um, Andrea's first Ally Institute um, that helped me figure out how to translate some of what I found working in classrooms with 12 or 20 students into classrooms with 200 students. Hi everyone, I'm Brandon Golub, and this is my second year at UCI, and so I know that we have larger sample sizes of perspective as always, which I love just being here and getting to learn from that and hear both across departments and experiences and similar layers previously at USC, and so going from that space of working with my seminars were roughly 18 to 19 to now upwards of 200 and seeing the ability to translate so much of what you do in those different spaces, which we owe to Andrea and others on this panel as well who help us think about it, so thank you. I'm Angela Jenks. I'm an associate professor of teaching in the Department of Anthropology. Um, I also participated in the first Active Learning Institute and learned an enormous amount from Andrea, um, particularly about applying active learning in larger classrooms, um, and so I've, I've, had, I've been teaching in the, the new building in, with classes of 50 students, of 80 students, and now in one of the lecture halls with 250 students, um, and have been focused on different kinds of active learning that I've used in each of those different, different contexts. Okay, great, thank you. I clearly picked the right panel. Thank you for the <laughs> shout outs. Um, so to get us started, I'm gonna have this first question go to, to Laura and Ted. Um, we've heard a lot today about the, the benefits for active learning for students, but for you as the instructors, what has been rewarding about using active learning in your classes? Can I take just a minute to not answer that question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there's just one thing that, one point that I wanna emphasize that that I knew before I did the ALI, and it was really sort of, you know, how do you implement this? And, and it, I, so I'm a psychologist, and psychology has this long history of studying how people learn in memory, right? It goes all the way back to Ebbinghaus in the middle of the, you know, 1850, 1860. And, and all of that research and most of the teaching I had ever been exposed to had the same assumption, which is you learn when information is presented to you, and then, the way you assess what the learning is is you test it, right? And those are different things. And what the research of the last 20 years in psychology has shown that actually, I think, completely blew a lot of people away in psychology was you do a, once you've been exposed to material the first time, where you learn is when you're being tested, not when you see the, not when you're being presented with the information again. So, you know, in terms of a classroom, what that means is, you know, they've read the book maybe, you know, I've tried to get them to read a book, and now they're coming in and I'm going to present the same information to them, and they're not going to learn very much. That's what that research says, because that's just a representation of information they should already have had. Now, of course, if they haven't done the reading, then maybe the, the lecture helps a little bit. But, um, and so, in fact, you know, it turns out that what really supports learning is Having to recall information in a challenging way it can mean testing, it can mean interaction in class. And so basically that was this insight that I had when I went into this. And what I really like, I mean, I've always liked active learning because it seems to support that insight, right? Active learning is a way of getting students because they're actively engaged. They have to recall information. They're not just listening to me present it to them. And what I really like about it, about active learning as a concept, and as I said, I had been doing it in small classes, and it was being in the ALI that gave me the confidence to try it in this large 400 student lecture. It just seems like a crazy thing to do, because uh, you're losing control, and you know, there's all, you don't really know what's gonna happen, and you're wasting time, and all these reasons why it seems like it's not a good idea. And, but what I really liked about it is, in fact, in terms of, documented student learning, my students learn a whole lot more 
in this environment than they did in what I thought were really well-crafted lectures, even using clickers and things like that to get some engagement. Um, and so that just, you know, it overwhelmed me. And, and, and it, it, in the earlier talk, um, she was saying that the documentation was, you know, five or six percent improvements grades. I, I'm finding like a full 10 percent improvement in the grades. And, and I've been giving, you know, more or less the same kinds of tests for a, about 12 years. They're pretty well standardized, and they're not the same, but, but you know, they're all, they used to always be within one or two points of each other. And then suddenly they were like 10 points higher. Uh, actually, was over a period of about two or three years as I implemented sort of new things. And so that, you know, as, as an instructor, that's what I really like, it, is that it, it actually produces this documentable outcome of increased learning. And, and what more could you want? So, Thanks. So. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to follow. <laughs> um, and in this context, I feel as if I should be more data driven and I will come instead with very impressionistic responses. Um, so my large lecture class is world history. It's a lower division intro course. It's not a specific requirement, but it's a way that most students are fulfilling a multicultural GE, so they've somewhat self-selected. But they're mostly not passionate about being in that room. And switching to more active learning has made this space of me and between 150 and 200 students feel more comfortable. Some of what Brian was talking about in terms of context. Like I used to always say this, and now because we're doing things in class, it, the students follow through with, get to know the person next to you. Take, take a minute now and swap email or, or phone numbers because you're going to want to check in after class. Right? And if I just say that, it doesn't happen. But if I am then saying, all right, Brandon and Angela, I want the two of you to sit and like, solve this problem, do this thing. And then I want you to come back to class, the two of you, with you know, a 1% follow-on, not, not, not group work, not real homework, but just push this conversation a little bit. That gets the students talking. That breaks down some of the enemy of this large classroom. Um, and what Ted was talking about in terms of chaos, I have found truly delightful to be <laughs> in a room full of people where there's just a lot of hubbub and energy and not me saying, so, 1757 and the Battle of Plassey, why do we care about this? <laughs> right? But if I throw it to them and get them to open up their books to think with their notes, I tell them Google's fair game, like you didn't do the reading, but you might be able to figure out something on the internet. There is so much more engagement, and um, I don't have good tests that go from year to year, um, but I certainly saw a huge increase in average grades um, with winter 2019, the first time I was in the Alp in a big lecture in a big lecture hall. Maybe I'm just getting nicer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, Angela and Brandon, this next question will go to you two. So, how have your students responded either to the new building, if you've been teaching in there, or your your active learning strategies? How have they been reacting, responding? What have they been doing? Uh, so. Most of my evidence comes from student feedback that they've written on mid-quarter evaluations and then end of quarter evaluations, and I've explicitly asked them about it. Um, so I teach anthropology, but I teach mostly medical anthropology. Um, and the majority of my students are pre-med students who are taking a class for a GE requirement. So they have to take a social science class, and they saw something about disease or medicine in the title, so they're in my class. So I have a lot of students who come in unfamiliar with how you would read an anthropological text, or even how you would read anything that's not a textbook. Like, they're very adept at reading textbooks, um, but non-STEM reading, they're not, they're not as good at. Um, and a lot of them have, have given great feedback about the way that active learning has helped them actually see how they should apply information. So they come in also extremely good at memorizing and repeating information. And that's, that's what they have done, and they know how to study in that way, but they don't know how to read an article and figure out what was the main argument and what are critiques of that argument and how does it relate to then this case study that we're talking about. Um, and active learning they have highlighted as being one of the things that really helps them be able to actually apply things and not just kind of memorize terms, memorize definitions, memorize procedures, and then repeat that back on a test. 
Um, one of the big things I've noticed and that I'm continuing to work with and, and learned in the Active Learning Institute, I think, is how broad active learning is. That when I initially thought about it, like, is that like when students do a think pair share? Um, but it turns out that active learning is an enormous amount of things. Um, and as I teach classes of different sizes, um, I've implemented different, different aspects of it and students respond differently to it. So in my large lecture classes, they love polling. Um, so I've been using poll everywhere um, and they love to see and they comment all the time that it's so great to see what other people in the class are thinking in this anonymous way. So sometimes it's like review questions I'm asking, but very often I'm asking like opinions about policy issues. So we had one recently that was should a physician um, speak to their patients about firearm safety? And the students were like, oh, we had a whole bunch of like, don't know. No idea, I have no opinion, I haven't thought about it. And then we talk about, okay, so what is a health issue? How can we think about firearms and gun control as being health issues, what does that mean? We have a whole section on it and then we do it again and now they have opinions about that <laughs> and they love seeing each other's opinions. So they've responded really positively to that. In some of my smaller classes, we've done project-based learning where they are in a group for the entire quarter working on one overall project. Um, and there's a lot because of the Active Learning Institute, I've learned about managing those groups <laughs> um, and with really a lot of hands-on kind of management and focus on the groups, that has been gotten a great response from students um, that they finally feel like they get to actually produce something in the class together and that they've learned from each other. Um, the biggest challenge I have had with student responses has been kind of on the fly talking to each other in a large lecture class. Um, and I think is that it's not anonymous. They do have to turn to somebody, have a conversation, but they don't build up any relationship the way that they do when they're in the pods throughout a whole quarter and we're doing, we're doing active learning in those pods, that's different, or when they have a group they're assigned to working on a project for the whole quarter. Um, I had a student just on my mid-quarter evaluation a couple weeks ago um, say that she was anxious the entire class session like waiting for the moment when I would say, turn to somebody and figure out this or, or look, at, look at this or answer this question together. Um, and that it was, it was affecting her entire experience in the class. And so I've been thinking a lot about how to, to deal with that. But I think student responses depend on the type of active learning, the type of classroom, and they require kind of different um, responses from faculty as well. And so in traditional classrooms and traditional setups, which I know we've all had an experience with, I think it's so easy for students to forget what a rich resource each other is. And we often don't teach that in the space. And it's always cite to the text or cite to what came out in lecture. But we often forget about what necessarily our colleagues are sharing or contributing. And not surprising, being in the space of criminology and law, we deal with a lot of controversial topics and a lot of divisive topics. And so a lot is very much driven by this collaborative meaning making space when we're thinking about abortion or we're thinking about hate motivated violence and a lot of so much to learn and it is a microcosm for what's going on across the world just in terms of differences of opinions about how those issues should be thought about and decided and so when you're not in the active learning space or definitely not in ALP it's really easy for people to operate in their silos and not realize that so much of this negotiation of different perspectives is what is at stake in terms of the material that we're learning and thinking about. And I hear from students, especially I teach a lot in the ALP room where they do get to sit in the pods, that that's what they remember is having their perspective challenged, thinking differently about abortion, responding to microaggressions, thinking about their various identities and how to interact with students and that that's what they apply to all these spaces both within the classroom and outside. And in terms of what's actually going on and with the work that they produce, I see in their essays too, because I exhort them at the beginning when I first taught the classes, it was all the citations again were to the text and to the lectures. And now they have these opportunities to of course do that, but they also can cite to their group activities. They can cite to the work that's produced in other groups and think about how we really do have this microcosm of different ways of thinking about this. And I think it ties a lot to what was already talked about in terms of social context, in terms of getting to know each other, in terms of realizing that their colleagues are a space of support, but even one step further, not just for the class, but in terms of, as we all know, higher education and a lot of spaces can be isolating in so many ways, but have had students come back two quarters later, three quarters later, a year later and say, 
someone in my group was also a non-traditional student from X background or was a transfer student, and we still connect about other topics. So I think that social context is so important for that classroom and their individual performance, but also has effects that we can never see just within that 10-week quarter. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left. No question from the audience. This is your last chance. Amber, you want to, you got to come to a, a mic since we're re recording. One thing while Amber's walking up, just one thing about what Andrea did that was really important was actually this alumni group. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like everything, you learn a lot of stuff when you're in the ALI, but it's actually meeting with our colleagues and having these conversations that has gotten me over time to keep adding more and more things and trying more and more things. And it's, it's just, it's really important. Thank you. I agree. I love hanging out with everybody <laughs> still. Okay, Amber, go for it. So I teach in composition where the way that we test students is asking them to write an essay. And in thinking about Ted's, uh, Ted's point about grades being higher after active learning, I've also gotten to take part in the active learning seminar and found that one of the benefits was that I was actually able to grade harder uh, because the level of learning demonstrated in these essays um, exponentially rose. So now all of a sudden my A, like my solid A, was like a B range, B plus, because I felt like we, we talked about that, we covered those things and they'd done a lot of peer review. So I'm wondering how you, on the departmental level you make the argument um, to a dean or something like that where you say, look, the grades might not be higher, but more learning is happening, and that that is probably more important than higher grades, arguably. Good question. Any of you having that conversation? I wish so we were. I, <laughs> I have been very interested lately in ungrading, which I have brought up at I think every yeah. meeting that we ever have. Um, and I'm doing that next quarter. This quarter coming up, we're gonna take a, I'm going to take a class to ungrading. Um, but it's exactly this issue that grades don't always, it's the question of whether or not grades actually reflect learning um, and what grades really do reflect. And they don't always, they might in some ways, but I think we don't do enough kind of interrogation of what kinds of learning the grades are actually reflecting and whether or not grading as we traditionally do it is actually the best way to measure learning. Um, and so I think I have focused on it by trying to emphasize what it is that I really do want students to learn and then think very much about how, it, how I can demonstrate that learning that may or may not overlap with traditional grading systems. And I think this explanation of what the learning measure is because I know that, as you said, with papers, the active learning space and the ALP space has enabled me to make more difficult writing assignments that they work through multiple yeah. iterations of mm -hmm. and they exchange with their peers. And I know Andrea has gotten so much love and deserves all of it. And I think also when we <laughs> think about, um, I know Josh is here with the learning assistant program and for those of who, us who use that as well, is they're also getting feedback from learning assistants and they're also going through these multiple iterations and learning assistants are coming back to continue to think about the topics and work through it. So that presentation to deans or administration that says, well, our final project you know, they may be getting, you know, not as, you know, high of a grade, but look at all the different ways, and it's because it can be more challenging, all of the different times that we assessed it throughout the course and all the multiple levels of feedback that they were able to integrate instead of just sitting in a silo on their own, thinking about what's the best way to incorporate just my professors or just my TA's feedback. Great. Thanks, you guys. That does bring us uh, right up to the end. I don't want to make you late for lunch. That's like the worst thing we can do at a, <laughs> at a conference. So uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much to the panel, you guys. I really appreciate you coming and giving your insights on all of this.